I looked everywhere to find a gift for you, and this just seemed to fit. I love it. Drew? Yeah, your turn. All right. <laughs> no way, Jesus. Seriously? Oh, yeah. 20 ounces of Coke? Yeah, baby. Woo! This is awesome. Oh, Jesus, thank you so much. You're welcome. Laura, we got to go show Richard our gifts. Come on. OK. Hey, Laura, is there a problem? No. I mean, well, yeah, kind of, you know? It's just that every time you give people gifts, you always give everyone else more than you give me. What do you mean? I mean, like, I open my gift and, oh, cute, eight ounces, and then Drew opens his gift and, hello, 20 ounces. Oh, I know what you mean. Well, that gift is for Drew. Well, that's what I want. Uh, go get it for me. Okay, if that's what you want. Yeah. I got a liter. Oh. I know, it's one liter of God's sweet goodness. <gasps> Jesus gave it to me. He did? Yes. Oh. Okay. You know what? You're going to meet somebody with a bigger bottle, and you are going to be so mad. Laura, yes. check it out. I got an upgrade. Coke 3.0. That is awesome. I know. <laughs> well, isn't that just great? Yeah. Hey, Jesus, you rock. Yeah. Thanks, what Drew. What is wrong with you? <sighs> Why are you holding back your best from me? I gave you my best. Don't you see what's happening here? You're letting everyone else's gifts steal your joy. Uh, no, Jesus, you are stealing my joy by giving everyone else more than you give me. Laura, I picked this gift out for you. That's what I wanted you to see. I don't care. Until you can look past this, all you're going to see is a can of Coke. I love this video for two reasons. Um, reason one, number one, even Jesus knows that Coke is better than Pepsi. <laughs> I mean, Coke is evidence that there is a God and that he loves us very much. Amen? Um, second reason, especially this time of year, it's easy to look at what God has given other people and not realizing the gifts that God has given us. Um, right? And this is what coveting does. Coveting cha changes the heart, that instead of chasing after the things of God, we go and chase after the things of the world. Right? And we want, we want, we want, instead of chasing after what God has for us. So we are going through um, the Ten Commandments. Um, question we have for us is, do, how do we look to God to meet our every need? Um, I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to read through the Ten Commands. Um, as we said last week, and you might have noticed this on our last song, we're still going through our technology upgrade. Um, so you have the screen behind me. I'm still flying blind, but we're, gonna, we're in this together. It's going to be a lot of fun. So we are on page... 43, so if you can open it up, we'll stand in a moment and we'll read that together. I'm going to ask you to stand up. In the Old Testament, when they read the law, the people stood for that. So as we've been reading through the Ten Commandments, we've been standing um, as we read. So verse 1 says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. The iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commands. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you should do no work, you, nor your sons, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger that, who is within your gates. 
For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor. You can have a seat. Follow along. We have two points as we go through, as we have been for a while now. We begin with the final tenth commandment. Key word in this verse 17, here is the word covet. Now, if you're going to look in a Bible dictionary, it might say something like a strong, uncontrolled desire. Probably a simpler way to define covet is, I want what I want, and I want it right now. It is the me, 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 or mine, 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 that your grandkids might yell back at you. It is your grandchild, when they go and get the pretzels, and you could say you have a handful, they're not taking three or four, but they're putting three or four on each of the five fingers and getting 20 or 30 and taking it back with them. Nod your head if you've ever seen this level of creativity in your kids or your grandkids. And it's kind of what the video says. God has given you his blessing, God supplies your every need. And yet when you see how God supplies the needs of others, you want that for yourself. And what coveting does, it changes the heart. Because you crave the things of the world instead of chase the things of God. And if you look at this command, some actually view this as two separate commands. Because it says, you should not covet your neighbor's house, and then in repeating itself, it says, you should not covet your neighbor's wife, nor male servant, nor female servant, ox, donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. It's interesting how it breaks it down. You should not covet your neighbor's house. That's a way of saying your neighbor's thing. So it's not okay to not covet their neighbor's house, but you covet the truck that is parked inside the neighbor's garage. Right? That doesn't work, does it? Well, I don't want the house. I just want the pool out back for myself. And then the other part of it, if the neighbor's house is the um, non-living, the second part is the living. You know, you want your, your neighbor's wife or your, or his male servant. Or who would not like a butler cleaning up after those grandkids when they come through? I mean, some of those kids are like a little hurricane of destruction, are they not? His ox, his donkey, maybe today um, we would say his farming equipment, his man cave, his tool shed out back. And if those things are not as clear, we have this last clause that kind of covers a little bit of everything. Nor anything that is thy neighbor's, right? That we want what we want, we see, and we think we deserve it more than they do. So what does it say, what does this verse say about the character of God? This is uh, our last command, and it's interesting how the tenth kind of bookends with the first. If you're still there, verse 1 and 2 says, The Lord... God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I am the God who knows everything. I am the God who supplies every need. I mean, the Israelites three months prior were slaves for the last 400 years building the pyramids in Egypt. And yet God was the one who provided every plague, God is the one who provided every step as they walked through the Red Sea. 
God is the one who daily provides manna from heaven and water out of rocks. That God knows everything going on in our life and that in providing every need, the first command is I desire to be first and foremost in your life. That you shall have no other gods but me. And what happens with coveting, it, it changes the heart that we end up craving the things of the world and putting them over chasing the things of God. So what does it say about God? That he wants the first and foremost place in our life. We looked at this verse previously. And my God shall supply, what does it say up there? All your need, or needs, depending on your translation, according to his riches and glory in Christ. Now to be God be the glory, that the God our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. That God shall supply all of your needs, right? Coveting says, God, I want, I want, I want. Right? And we cha change wants to needs and, say, and we say to God, God, what you have given me is not good enough. I don't want eight ounces of Coke. I want two liters of God's goodness towards all of us. Amen? Thank you. I appreciate that. Someone agrees. What this verse says about God is God, who is all-knowing and all-powerful, who is a good God and has blessed us in the past, wants to be first in our life, and in being first, God gives us what he thinks is best for us in the given situation. So what does this say about us? I mean, think about this, right? Three months ago, the Israelites were slaves. They were building the pyramids. God had provided for them every step of the way. And now God here says, do not covet your neighbor's house. Do any of them have houses at this point? No, they're sleeping out in the wilderness. In fact, the only thing they have is what they asked the Egyptians for before the final plague. Before the Passover, it says here, you can look above me. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. And they asked the Egyptians uh, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they get, granted them what they requested. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. Don't covet your neighbor's house. You mean their tent, which is right next to my tent? Don't covet your neighbor's male servant. Three months ago, they were the servants and the slaves. And then one's building the pyramids. So what does this commandment say about them? It says about them about the same thing it says about us. That we have wandering eyes. In a way, this commandment is like the commandment, do not steal, where it's easy to look at what other people have and covet that than it is to look after the things of God. I love how this is phrased, that the grass looks greener on the other side. It's because you can't see the poop from here. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Your neighbor comes home with a brand new truck, extended cab, has all the bells and whistles, and what does your eye say? You know what I deserve, that I want that truck for Christmas. Honey, instead of getting the other presents, I want to come home with the big bow and just, you know, hit the beeper and boom, that's Christmas. What the flesh doesn't tell you is that with the new truck comes a new payment. All right? The flesh doesn't tell you about the higher insurance rates. The flesh doesn't tell you about the premium gas. Right? Don't covet your neighbor's wife. The, the flesh doesn't tell you how it's going to destroy your marriage and fragment your family. And you're going to take one paycheck and divide it among two households. Coveting 
changes the heart. And it, what happens is we chase the things of the world instead of chasing the things of God. So the grass looks green on the other side. It's because you can't see the poop from here. What does Jesus say? That you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind. The second commandment is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. So God says, well, how should you look at other people? You should love them, as God has loved you. But coveting changes the heart. And instead of loving other people, you crave the things that God has given to them. And you say, you know what, I deserve that. I should have that more than they. But sometimes you realize, you know what, I can't get it, but it changes the relationships, right? Because what we do is like, well... You know what, Bob's got that new snowblower. I bet if I'm nice to him, maybe he'll come and let me use that snowblower come winter. Guy down the street, he's got a new hunting cabin. You know what, I'm going to go and, and be nice to him. Maybe he'll take me up to his hunting cabin this season. Coveting changes the heart. That instead of loving people as God has loved us, we look at people for what they can now do for us. Oh, I want to be nice to this coworker because when they get promoted, maybe that will help my, advance my career. And we crave the things God has given to other people instead of chase the things that God has for us. So when God says, do not covet, do not look at people for what they can do for you, do look at people what God has done for them, that he has loved them, that Christ has come to forgive them. And the most important need in their life is to hear the story of God's good news for them. That God so loved us that he gave us his one and only son that whoever believed in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. What are, sometimes if the reason we're not more outgoing in our faith is because we're not genuine in our relationships. Instead of loving people as God loved them, we are nice to people for what they may be able to do for us. And as a result, coveting changes the heart. So if coveting changes the heart, how shall we live? The grass isn't always greener on the other side. It's greener where you water it. Or maybe another way of saying it, hey, if the grass looks greener on the other side, maybe it's time to water your own lawn. Maybe it's time to look at your own heart. Maybe there's an issue of coveting there that you hadn't realized was there before. So how shall we live? Um, let's look at the words of 1 Timothy chapter 6 um, as we go through this final point here. First Timothy 6, 6 through 10 reads as such. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves through many sorrows. So far, we've kind of covered the last two verses. Many of you know, verse 10, that the love of money is the root of all evil, all kinds of evil. 
that through coveting, rich fall into temptation and snare. We do many foolish and stupid and harmful things. Why? Because coveting chases, changes the heart, and we crave the things of the world instead of chasing the things of God. So how shall we live if we're not to live this way? Let's look at the first part of this. Verse 6, that with godliness, now godliness with content is great gain. Now, looking at it, I see many parents and, and grandparents um, who are here this Sunday and who desire to model the things of God for their kids and grandkids. By the way, our kids and grandkids now more than ever need examples of real life faith. People who genuinely love God and chase the things of God after, instead of craving the things of this world. And I wonder if your grandkid or your child were given obituary where to reflect on your life, what are some of the characteristics that they would come up with? How would they describe your walk with God? Would they call you a, a man of great faith? Would they say that you're a woman of great prayer? And I imagine for many of you, um, they would reflect on certain characteristics in your life. I wonder how many of them would say, when I look at Grandpa, when I look at my Aunt May, when I look at this person, I see someone who is content and thankful for the things God has given them. Right? I mean, how do you reflect contentment in your life? I think the way you reflect contentment in your life isn't chasing after all the gadgets, isn't chasing after all the lusts of the things of this world, but it's really saying, you know what, I'm thankful for the things God has given me. Would I love a Ferrari? Yes, I would. Would I love the payments of a Ferrari? No, I would not. You know what? So instead of having a 2020 whatever, I have a 2005 minivan. You know what? It gets me to A and B just fine. And by the way, it's better than a Ferrari. I could actually fit all my kids inside of it. Though I bet one of them would love to ride on the roof. I bet they wouldn't mind that at all. So how do we model how do we model this for our kids? I think we model it for our kids in saying that look, this time of the year it's all about me, 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 I, I, want, want, want. And instead of being God, we are thankful for the blessings you have given us. You know what? God may have given other people greater blessings or more blessings or better blessings, but I'm thankful that God loves me and has given me the things He's given me. Right? Because sometimes we think of Thanksgiving like it's a one day of a year holiday that we're going to thank, reflect on being thankful. No. The idea of being thankful and being content is not chasing after the things of this world, but chasing after the things of God. So one of the ways we combat covetousness in our own life is that we model contentment for our kids and our grandkids. And I think the easiest way to show contentment is to be thankful in the midst of other people having, quote, unquote, better stuff than you. Right? Because the grass isn't always greener on the other side. You just see, can't see the car payments from here. You just can't see the counseling sessions they go through from here. God, you are the one who knows me and he meets every need. And Lord, if you give me an eight ounce can of Coke, I'm going to drink it and be thankful for the eight ounces you've given me. Because verse 7 is also true. Right? You brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And if you live your life craving the things of this world, you're going to miss chasing the blessings of God. So how do we model godliness for our kids? I think we model contentment. We do so through thanksgiving. And I think the second way we model for our kids and our grandkids is we model generosity. I am, uh, okay, I'm behind a slide. Sorry about that. Yeah, there we go. Forgive me, I'm, I'm literally doing this almost blindfolded. So we model generosity. It is the most wonderful time of the year, is it not? 
And this is a time of the year where it, we say it is better to give than to receive. But man, the world doesn't act like it, does it? I mean, the way the world treats this time of the year is, man, you got to get up at 5 a.m. on Black Friday, or you got to give up Thanksgiving dinner to go chase after the latest thing. Um, look, if God has given you great stuff, and by the way, we're Americans, God has given us all great stuff. You know, I had a friend who once says, you're born an American, you've already won the lottery of life. And the people who are the poorest in this country, given the same wealth, would live like kings around the world. And if you've never been to a truly third world country, it's hard to describe the, the generosity God has bestowed upon us. So maybe in this Christmas season, is a time to not just model contentment, but also, how do we model generosity for our kids and our grandkids? Right? As God has given to us, we're going to be intentional in giving and blessing other people. And there's a couple of ways you can do this. Um, you know, sadly, in our country, you know, there's great disparity in wealth. I mean, you just look at the white church it's on a Saturday that it's open. There are people in this area who are hurting. And maybe you model... Um, generosity, realizing, look, I have great wealth, I can't take it with me, you know what, I'm going to help another family in need this Christmas. Or maybe I don't know who the family is, but, you know, there's organizations like Life Path and New Hope who have, you know, direct contacts with these type of people. You know what, maybe I'm going to write a check to, to help someone through a manner like that. I think our kids need to see examples of us not just chasing after other stuff, but using the stuff God has given us to invest in other people. Because right? what is the, what are the words of Jesus? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Right? Love your neighbors. You love yourself. So much so, Jesus says, you know, if you have two jackets and you see someone doesn't have any jackets, what should you do? Give them one. Right? Because in doing so, you show the love of Christ. So how do you model things that are godly to your kids in a world that is chasing the latest gadget, the latest toy, the bigger, better, newest, fastest? I mean, I said this a couple weeks ago. I don't know what people do with all those Black Friday TVs. I mean, they're on sale every year, and they're chasing after them. At the end of the day, it's still the same picture, Right? Maybe you are intentional with your stuff to model generosity to your kids or grandkids this, this year because they need to see that godly characteristic so desperately in our society. Hey, as we could close this morning, we're going to ask ourselves a couple questions. First, we're going to ask ourselves this. Where do you need to guard your heart? If you look at the command here, it's very thorough. Um, as much as with any other command, it says, don't covet your neighbor's house. And I think that doesn't mean anything in your neighbor's house. And then it goes down to break it down. Don't covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his, nor his donkey, nor his cattle, nor anything that is your neighbor's. There's like nine things that just list there, just one after the other after the other. Because you might be thinking, well, I'm good. I, I don't covet my neighbor's house. But maybe there's something else of your neighbors you do covet. That snowblower. Man, their collection is a whole lot more impressive than mine. Or their gun case, or their sporting... You get what I'm saying? You know, I, I think in 2019 where everything's so visual and everything is so in your face, it's hard not to look at the blessings God has given other people and think that I deserve that or I want that for myself. And what the flesh will tell you is you need this. And what ends up happening is, man, you dread the payment come next month. Guard your heart. With contentment is great 
godliness. Contentment, living within your means and treasuring the blessings that God has given you. you know, some of us, maybe we're not as strong as we think and, and maybe there's a, a moment of confession in our own heart that we say, look, God, in this area, I look after these things instead of chasing the things of you. And I think that's why this commandment's so thorough. And maybe in your own pew, in the quietness of your own heart, you need a moment of confession to say, God, you know what? Today is a day I realign my heart to the things of you. Lord, I give this to you. I confess that you have blessed me and you've provided for me. Help me to, to be content in the blessings that you've given. And the second is, how can you invest in your family this week? Most of us are, are parents or grandparents. We have people in our life who look up to us. And being here Sunday morning, they see um, pillars of faith. They see people who love the Lord our God. How can we model things like contentment and generosity? Because those next generations desperately need to see that modeled in us. That when they look at Grandpa, when they look at Aunt May, when they look at whomever, they see, wow, Dad's godly because he chases after the things of God as opposed to chasing after the things of the world. You know, I hear, Dad, I would be complaining about that old Ford. I'm not sure why I said Ford. Um, but, man, he's thankful that car is going to give him another year. Right? Everybody else is upgrading to the in-ground pool, but, but Grandpa is just using his money to invest in other people, using his time to, to donate, to give, where it's so easy to, to take and to receive. You know, how can you model generosity and can and contentment and thankfulness to your kids and your grandkids this week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Um, Lord, we understand that the love of money is the root of all evil. Lord, it's, it's easy to, to fall into temptation, to, to wander, to go astray. Lord, to, to crave the things of this world instead of chase the things of God. Lord, realign our hearts and our minds Lord, allow us, as we say, we love you with all of our heart, to allow you to sit on the throne of our hearts, to be thankful, to be content, to enjoy the blessings that you've given us. So we say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together as we close.